Welcome to our world, driven by electrical power. It's hard to find any part of our lives which does not benefit from electrical technology. It is everywhere. It's easy to take it for granted, but this electrical world is constantly in motion. It is the collective work of millions. Engineering and understanding the materials used in our electrical world is the keystone to making it all run. Advancements in materials directly leads to advancements in technology. Smaller, faster, more durable, flexible, more precise. All of these are the results of improvements in materials and design. So what are the materials that make it all work? And how do we get these materials from nature? Iron. Since ancient times, it has been used as a compass to point toward magnetic north. And since then, inventors and engineers have found new roles for this material. The thing to know about iron is it's a metal. So iron is used in industrial magnets and kind of the common magnets that you see. It's used in electronics, it's used in appliances, it's used in making cars, it's used in hair accessories, it's used everywhere. When you look at a power plant, most of that stuff in, in generators is made out of steel. There's the second largest commodity in the world next to oil. So, why is iron so special? And where does it come from? So the Masabi Iron Range uh, historically produced some of the most pure iron ore available. It, these rocks were laid down as sedimentary layers of iron oxide bearing rocks. The combination of dissolved iron in the water and the availability of oxygen provided by new life forms in the form of algae made for the creation of iron oxides and then because they are heavy small little granules they settle out through the water column. This happened at 1.8 billion year time period. Good magnetic taconite with fine disseminated magnetite throughout in this piece. Another example here with some uh, you see the difference in color between pale and dark. The dark is magnetite bearing, the pale is not. Iron occurs in many forms, but hematite and magnetite are the most abundant for iron mining. So we set blasts and we basically extract it out of the ground through shovels and blasting media. And then from there it goes to a crusher. At, it's our primary crusher at the mine. Uh, it goes through a secondary crusher uh, made to a finer rock. And from the crusher it goes to our concentrator. And it is uh, pulverized by the rod mill. It then goes down to the magnetic separators. So here you see we've got a magnetic separator that's already out and out of service. It's not in line right now, but it's a little easier to explain how it works this way. So you can kind of see down here on the bottom, uh, when we pull this out, we've still got material, <coughs> magnetic material that's stuck to the magnet. So you can kind of see the magnet starts about here. How this machine works is that the magnet is attached to the shaft. Then the drive unit rotates the outer shell around the fixed magnet. The magnet picks up the iron units, carries them up to the discharge lip, dumps them over to the discharge lip, Everything that is not iron-based falls out the bottom of the tub and goes to the tailing spot. For every four tons of material that comes out, one ton stays in the process, three tons get put out into the tailing space. The entire electrical industry started with magnetic separators. In 1831, Joseph Henry built a powerful electromagnet and used it in a commercial mining operation. Before Henry's invention, electricity was only a curiosity and an area of scientific experimentation. His first electromagnets were made from iron cores wrapped in copper wire and were insulated by pieces of his wife's wedding dress. Henry built a magnetic device used to separate high quality magnetite from impurity and thus began the birth of the electrical industry. We take the iron content, it flows through pipes over to the filtering process. The filters uh, extract the water. 
and after it goes from the filters it is transferred to balling where there's these huge balling drums that rotate around and around and around until it makes these, we call them green balls. The drying zone um, will burn off any excess water that's in the green ball. As it gets past the drying zone, it all ends up right up in here in the preheat. And the preheat then kicks up big time in temperature, so we go from roughly 600 degrees up to about 2,000 degrees. Magnetite is then turned to hematite by a redox reaction, which is an oxidation reduction reaction. There's a, about a retention time of about 15 to 20 minutes in the kiln, and this part of the process is what takes to harden our pellet. So the pelletization process involves making small pellets using bentonite. Iron is pelletized mainly for mobility. So we're able to put it into rail cars and able to move it quite efficiently. The overall goal of iron processing is to make a quality pellet that meets our customer specs. That when the pellets get to the blast furnaces, they need to have a certain strength and a certain chemical makeup so it's the most efficient process possible. After processing, the two main forms of iron are on their way for future use. But what makes this metal special for electrical products? Iron does two jobs at once. It is strong and provides structure, and it has special magnetic properties. Magnetic fields tend to stray and permeate space. However, by adding an iron core, you can concentrate magnetic fields and easily increase power by 10 times or more. Alloying is mixing a metal with other materials. When you mix iron with carbon, you get steel. We can also alloy iron to improve magnetism. So although iron is kind of the star of the magnetic world, it's often paired up with other elements such as um, nickel or cobalt. To make the kind of sophisticated electronic devices that are used today, you need those unusual alloys to get the electromagnetic properties that you want. And the only reason we can have you know, nice, thin, lightweight laptops and so on is because we're using those rare earth magnets who could not do it without you know, magnets of that amazing strength at ridiculously tiny little sizes. Magnetic energy passing through steel can have some negative effects. Eddy currents create heat and loss of energy. In order to make motors and transformers more energy efficient, we sometimes use thin laminated steel sheets in the cores made of a special steel called electrical steel. Electrical steel has less carbon and more silicon. It is normally made in an art furnace from recycled structural steel. Transformers are extremely important in electrical power systems and are found everywhere. They come in many shapes and sizes and they do many different jobs from changing voltages to stopping radio interference in your favorite appliances. Transformers use an iron coil to transfer magnetic energy from one coil to another through magnetic induction. The iron coil is made in different ways. This is made up of what's called steel laminations. There's a, a bunch of plates of steel all sandwiched together to make up this core. Another use for iron is powdered iron. Now this is a similar to ferrite, however it is just iron broken up and mixed into a polymer and then compacted together to form a uh, torus here. Hi, my name is James and I'm an optical engineer. What we do here at SkySight is we fly high definition cameras. So what we have sitting in front of me is uh, a multi-copter or more accurately an octocopter because she has uh, eight DC motors on her. 
So we take a copper wire and wrap it around a ferromagnet, or iron in this case, and put a current through it. And that current creates an electromagnet, which produces a magnetic field, which when placed in the presence of another magnetic field, which you can see permanent magnets on the housing here, creates a magnetic force. And that magnetic force is turned into a torque, which then spins the motor. Tesla Motors is revolutionizing the automotive industry. Kind of unique in the rear of Model S, you see the electric motor here on this side, and power electronics is all here on this side. These are all liquid cooled, they're all shrink wrapped right between the uh, wheels, the rear wheels along the axle of Model S. So the motor consists of two parts the rotor and the stator. So you have your aluminum, you have your steel, and you have your copper. We use steel laminations, which are made with iron. Your copper is actually what creates your magnetic field around your rotor. Your steel laminations here actually concentrate your magnetic field. The only points of contact in the motor are the bearings. There are no brushless. It's a full brushless AC motor. It puts out 290 kilowatts. It's a four pole, three phase, AC induction motor. Some roller coasters use linear motors so that the ride can be started and stopped anywhere. The job of the roller coaster designer is to find the acceleration settings that give the most fun. Like every motor, the linear motor has two parts, the stationary part and the moving part. Both of these parts have magnets on them, on the stationary part, you have a long sequence of magnets. Now the motor designer's goal is to make sure that you arrange the currents in all of these magnets so that a north pole is always attracting a south pole or a north pole is always repelling another north pole. And by switching those, the currents in the magnets on the moving part and on the stationary part, you develop the magnetic fields that propel the moving part along the track. Generators are a lot like electric motors, except they work in reverse. The rotor is made to move against the magnetic forces, creating electricity. Just one generator alone may use many tons of iron. The great strength of steel holds generators together, and it is also necessary for the entire rest of the grid, holding up power lines and making for strong antennas. Hi, my name is Jermon. I'm a musician. The first thing I'll talk about is how you can get a guitar to make sound, because if you strum it, it doesn't make any sound. And then with electricity, you can get something out of it. So if we imagine that this table is the magnet in a guitar pickup, um, if you could see the magnetic field lines, they would come out and all around and up into the other pole of the magnet. Now, the string will exist crossing through this field, and as it moves, it changes the way the field lines will conduct through it. And the coil around the magnet detects the change in flux as a current flowing through it. So what we have here is um, an old tube amplifier. Guitar amplifiers still rely on the same technology as this. Now, this device uses quite a lot of iron in it. You see that there are actually three transformers. The biggest one here being the power transformer. This is going to take the 120 volts main current and step it down for all of the filaments which heat up the tubes which allow them to operate and also step up the voltage to a couple hundred volts in order to drive the actual amplifying circuitry. So the last part of the audio chain is the speaker. So I'm going to Go ahead and take a knife to this speaker and we'll find out what it actually looks like inside. This coil right here is the voice coil. This is where the current from the amplifier actually goes and this creates its own magnetic field which counteracts the magnetic field formed by the magnet back here. Now these two metal pieces which you could see from the outside but now you can very 
easily see the gap formed by them. These two um, iron pieces actually will conduct the magnetic field from the magnet and focus it right in here, which gives us a very, very high field intensity, which allows a little bit of current in there to cause a great deal of force on the cone. Iron is a very important part of the recording medium. Essentially, what you're doing is magnetizing a tiny little strip of rust. It's, you know, it's ferric oxide, um, and that can be magnetized and demagnetized uh, to make the zeros and the ones. And um, uh, there's this incredibly fine film of, of oxidized iron on all of those tapes and discs and so on that you've got. I'm Joanne Larson. I work at Seagate in a design center. I have two drives here just to illustrate a couple of form factors that we design. This is an example of a two and a half inch drive, as we call it, uh, which would be used, for example, in a notebook computer. A hard disk drive is so named because the heart of the matter is where the data is stored, which is on these disks, and the data is stored magnetically as ones and zeros or as magnetic bits that are, that are oriented north or south. We use ferritic iron uh, in alloys for the magnetic part of the transducer and in the, the layers on the media. It is read or written, as we say, by very small transducers on heads the, so the disc is spinning under the head and uh, there is an air flow or shear between this air bearing surface and the media surface. This is a very close view of the transducer. When we write, and this is the right pole, the flux is essentially focused through that pole. The corresponding area on the media below it is magnetized very simple in concept uh, and an amazing amount of technology. <laughs> Whether used for its magnetic properties or its strength, iron is an essential mineral. You may think we have moved far beyond the Iron Age, but the fact is we never left it.